I think history is going to win. That's once inflation gets about 5%. It's never come down without a recession. And I think a recession is in the cards. I just don't know when. We have about, depending on who you listen to, a trillion and a half to two trillion of excess savings now. So it may take some time to work through that savings. But given the extent of the asset bubble and the destruction in the markets, given what's going on in Ukraine, given zero COVID policy in China, um, I don't take a lot of comfort from that. So I assume, um, and I pretty strongly assume, we're going to have a recession sometime in 23. I just don't know whether it's going to be in the early part or the later part. And again, um, it's a guess. It's not a fact. I mean, one of the most challenging things for me right now is maybe it says something about my dysfunctional personality, but I've always made even higher returns in bear markets and bull markets. But the way I did it was just pretty much ignore equities, take them off the table, buy bonds, buy treasuries and go home. Well, I've never present, been presented a cocktail where you have 8% inflation, you think the economy might weaken and bond yields 3%. It's an analog with no precedent in history. So for the golfers out there, going into the situation we're describing, I feel like I'm about to play a round of golf without a driver and without a 60 degree wedge because bonds, which have been my go-to asset in terms of, of a recessionary bear market atmosphere, they may work, but there's good reason to believe things may be different this time because we've never had central banks with situation in Europe, for example, we have negative rates with 8% inflation, or even here, we've never had anything like this. So you always, you can't get into black and white. That It's an art form investing in from cycle to cycle. You have to constantly innovate and not just be a slave to past models. Crypto, obviously you've done kind of a little bit in crypto before. I remember you saying that it's just hard to guess the size of position that is interesting to you in crypto. One thing I was wondering, are you seeing crypto start to affect other asset classes and other currencies? Um, I don't know whether I'm seeing it, but I expect it to. You can't take, you can't build over two trillion in wealth in purchasing power and then take a trillion of it out and not matter. John, I also, have high frequency um, signals. And there certainly seems to be a strong correlation between crypto and the NASDAQ. I don't think it takes a genius to figure out why. So I'm looking at it as an indicator that way. Crypto, um, you know, everything that, that Charlie Munger says about it, I'm sympathetic to. Everything that says Bill Miller says about it, I'm sympathetic to. So I think that's a movie that has yet to be played out and one that I don't want to bet on in conviction, but I will be very surprised if blockchain isn't a real force in our economy, say five years from now to 10 years from now, and not a major disruptor with, with companies that will um, have been founded between now and then that'll do very well, but that will also challenge things like our, our financial companies and do a lot of disruption. So I find crypto interesting. My 69th birthday is in a couple of weeks. I'm probably too old um, to compete in intellectually with the young people in this space, but I'm certainly monitoring it. As I think about um, Bitcoin, the closest analog is clearly gold. And you know, people talk about digital gold, by which I mean, if you want to remove yourself from cash, if you want to be independent from inflation, your government in whichever country uh, uh, you're in, Traditionally, gold would be the assets that you would kind of pull back into. Nowadays, that can be Bitcoin. And so you'd expect their cyclicality to be similar. And yes, Bitcoin is highly cyclical. Gold is counter-cyclical historically. Why is that? I'm not sure why other than NASDAQ type risk play takers are the ones that send to play in Bitcoin and curmudgeons that are gold bugs and want the world to fall apart playing gold, but there's no question, and this I've watched and it's gone on long enough now that I believe it, that if you believe we're going to have irresponsible monetary policy and inflation going forward, 
if it's in a bull phase, you want to own Bitcoin. But if it's in a bear phase for other assets, you want to own gold. And I think I just articulated the reason, but sometimes, John, I don't care. Um, this has gone long on enough that I'm starting to believe what I'm observing. And for sure, if I think we're going to have an inflationary bull market, um, I'd want to own Bitcoin more than gold. And if I thought we we're going to have a bear market, you know, stagflation type thing, I'd want to own gold. Doesn't mean I'm going to believe that in a year, but that's my assumption going forward from this point. And is that because of some fundamentals of the underlying assets or just based on what you've observed in their behaviors to date? It's 85% what I've observed, but I would also say it's the type of investor. Um, over the counter um, FANG type investors, if they believe in inflation and they tend to be younger, they want to play Bitcoin. Uh, old curmudgeons that, that secretly want the world to fall apart, they don't own Bitcoin, they own gold. So, but that's kind of cheating because that's kind of a, a reason I've made up for what I've observed, I think. You gotta, you gotta know your own biases. If I was a tech investor, um, I would certainly be learning, you know, we had the internet wave, we had the cloud wave, cloud doesn't look like it's over yet, but I would certainly be learning be looking into blockchain very deeply and to the possible disruption it might take. But I think fundamentals are fundamentals. Look, when companies are losing money, capacity is always going to shrink and their margins are going to look better in three years. When companies are over earning, their margins are going to come down in three years. I think all that stuff will be out there. I think the great thing about my original mentor, Spiros Drellis in Pittsburgh, was he made me focus on what moves the stock price. Like you can't just say, Stan, okay, this is a great company and the earnings are great. He said, tell me how people are gonna think differently in 18 or 24 months about the situation than they're thinking now. That would be my number one advice to the young people. Do not, do not invest in the present. The present is not what moves stock prices, change moves them. And I want you to try and envision a different world in a year and a half from now and where these security prices would trade versus now, given the world you envision. That would be my number one advice to a young person getting in the business. This is my 45th consecutive year as a chief investment officer. And in 45 years, I've never seen a constellation while I was a practitioner or frankly studied one where there's no historical analog. So right now I probably have more humility in terms of my views going forward than I've had maybe ever. But I would say if I have an objection out there, in 2009 I made a statement inside the firm was, well, we won't have another financial crisis for 30 or 40 years because once you have one of these, everyone learns from it and we get discipline and it takes them that long to screw up again. The last one we had was obviously 29. I'm not so sure I buy into all this stuff about bank balance sheets and this and that. What the central banks globally have done the last 10 or 11 years, I'm not predicting this, John, but it leaves me open-minded to something really bad. Um, so that's the guy on this shoulder we were talking about earlier. Um, the other shoulder is saying, this is an analysis harder than you've ever faced in 45 years. So please be open-minded because Bitcoin more than gold. And if I thought we we're going to have a bear market, you know, stagflation type thing, I'd want to own gold. Doesn't mean I'm going to believe that in a year, but that's my assumption going forward from this point. And is that because of some fundamentals of the underlying assets or just based on what you've observed in their behaviors to date? It's 85% what I've observed, but I would also say it's the type of investor. Um, over the counter um, FANG type investors, if they believe inflation and they tend to be younger, they want to play Bitcoin. 
uh, old curmudgeons that, that secretly want the world to fall apart. They don't own Bitcoin, they own gold. So, but that's kind of cheating because that's kind of a, a reason I've made up for what I've observed, I think. You gotta, you gotta know your own biases. Um, yes. Go, going back to how you work and, you know, kind of the young man's game and things like that. Um, I talked to someone who worked for you who said maybe an underrated aspect of your performance historically is you just work way harder than everyone else. And there's few people who have been in the market since the 70s working with your work ethic uh, and, you know, across such a broad range of assets. H how, how relevant do you think that is or how much truth do you ascribe to that? I think it's very relevant. Um, I was pretty lazy in college and I never considered myself a particularly hard worker, but I'm so passionate about our business that it's almost like a compulsive gambler that has a, a way to channel his compulsive. And the fact that every event in the world affects some security price somewhere, and the fact that I'm so intellectually stimulated trying to imagine the world 12 to 18 months from now versus the way it looks in the present and security prices, how they would reflect that. I just find it so stimulating. It makes everybody think I'm a hard worker because I'm attracted to the game. So in this game, I am a hard worker, but I actually think there's a life lesson there. I've seen young people who, when they find their passion, who had kind of looked like they were lazy or lost their way or weren't very driven, become very driven. I just happen to be passionate about this particular discipline. So I don't know whether I have a hard work ethic, but it, that, that's the end result of my passion. Are, are you then uh, excited about the growth of mobile investing and you know approachable retail investing for kind of a younger crowd because it might pull more people into this? Or do you think it might get people in for the wrong reasons and it's a bit more of a you know blinking slot machine game? The latter, I mean, given given what's gone on the last 11 years with central bank policy and the breadth of the bubble, I do fear for, um, you know, one of the sayings, I'm sure you've heard it, but I probably heard it the first week I was in the business 50 years ago, it's still applied, bull market geniuses. Um, I think there's a lot of bull market geniuses around, and it's not that they love the game, they love winning, but they were surfing with a hurricane behind their back that was giving them these nice waves. They, they may become very discouraged. So I don't embrace, I've heard a lot of people embrace the fact that all these people are investing now in all these and how great it is. I don't think it's so great if the story doesn't end well. Yeah. And, and, and certainly we may see an interesting scenario play out over the next year or two. Um, Going back to your style, the other thing I found very interesting uh, in how you work is this, uh, you know, your philosophy of put all your eggs in one basket and then watch this basket very carefully. And you've described uh, how you just develop conviction three to four times a year and act based on that. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that, like the, the spidey sense going off and, you know, you're, you're clearly in low conviction time right now. But I think that's just very stylistically interesting where you even know how to size up and down your trades. Yeah, it's it's completely contrary to what they teach in business school, which is if you're highly diversified, you have less risk than if you're highly concentrated. Um, I don't believe that at all. As an investor, when I think most people get in the most trouble is when they have stale longs or stale shorts. When you've got 15, 20% of your asset base or sometimes in macro positions, I'll have two or three hundred percent. Um, believe me, they're not getting stale and you have to have ruthless discipline and you're coming in every day, just to quote Andy Grove, you could not be more paranoid and you're constantly reevaluating. And I think it leads to an open mind. So yeah, I would also say, people ask me what I learned from George Soros. Um, I thought when I went there, I was going to learn what made the yen and the Deutsche Mark go up and down and that kind of thing. No, what I learned was um, sizing is probably 70 to 80 percent of the equation. It's not a whether you're right or wrong. It's how much you make when you're right and how much you lose when you're wrong. 
I've also found as an investor, I believe in streaks. You see it in baseball, you see it in everything else. I see it in investing. Sometimes you're seeing the ball, sometimes you're not. One of my number one jobs is to know whether I'm hot or cold. And when I'm hot, I'm supposed to turn the dial way up, not, not say, okay, I'm up 40% this year. Let's go. This will look good at the end of the year. Go take a break. No, you got to make hay while you're hot. And then when you're cold, the last thing you should do is try and make big bets to get back to even. You should, you should t tone yourself down. So believe it or not, that's, that's part of the all your eggs in one basket. Not only do I have to see the, see the investment that really excites me, I also have to see myself sort of being in, in a good, in a good trade, trading rhythm. I think this is so interesting, this notion of, first off, having hot and cold streaks, because I think, you know, some people would take issue to that, and, you know, people debate whether hot hands exist in basketball and all this sort of stuff, but kind of believing in that, but also being kind of self-aware to know that I am cold, I'm going to do trades, but just small ones to, you know, keep myself from doing anything stupid. And then, uh, as you say, kind of when you're hot, uh, uh, really being able to kind of size with conviction based on that. Do you know when other people are hot, by the way? So people at the firm now at Duquesne, do you know when to egg them on to size up their positions? Because you can tell they have it together. I size up their views. And the answer is yes. So the dark art of technical analysis um, there are technicians out there. They're all rational. They all look at a lot of history. No one runs more hot and cold than technicians. One of your main jobs, if you follow technicians, is to know when they're hot and know when they're cold. Some of them that get so cold, you can actually fade them and go the other way because they've got themselves all twisted up. It's more fun to follow one who's hot and make money with them. But yeah, absolutely. I see guys within my own firm, analysts who recommend things, and they go on streaks too, or they get an area and they, they're really hot. And my job as a trigger puller is to size them up. 